Number 5. Roger Dean After waking up on the morning of November 21st, 1985, Doris Jean Dean, who went by DJ, had a bath in her upscale home in Lone Tree, Colorado. As she was getting out of the tub, her husband, 51-year-old Roger Dean, told her that she needed to come into the bedroom. When she did, she was startled because a man wearing a balaclava was aiming a gun at Roger. The masked man ordered Roger to tie up DJ and then to put duct tape over her eyes. Roger complied and then he was led to a different room across the hall. The man kept coming back into the bedroom and asking DJ how much money Roger had in his bank account, but she didn't know. The third time the man came into the bedroom, Roger tried to run away. There was a scuffle and Roger screamed, I'll give you the 30,000 you, but he was cut off by a gunshot. It was meant to be a warning shot, but the bullet ricocheted and struck Roger. Now bleeding, Roger ran down the stairs and the gunman chased him. He fired another shot inside the house and Roger was hit again. Then, as Roger lay at the end of his driveway, the masked man shot him four more times while his neighbors watched on. The masked man then ran to a car that was parked a block away and drove off. Sadly, Roger was pronounced dead just an hour later in the hospital. Immediately, the police noticed a few oddities with the case. First, Roger usually left for work at 6.15am, but on the morning that he died, he was seen drinking coffee in his garage at around 7am. Secondly, he only had rope tied around one wrist. Also, when he was taken to the hospital, he was wearing contact lenses, but his glasses had duct tape on them. Finally, Roger just had opened a bank account and put $32,000 in it. This led police to believe that Roger knew the gunman and set up the robbery himself. The theory is that Roger let in his killer through the garage. The gunman was supposed to take Roger to the bank, withdraw the money, and then Roger would claim the money was stolen. Instead, something went horribly wrong and Roger ended up dead. A short time after Roger's murder, his daughter, Tamara, started to get threatening phone calls. The calls were so bad that she and her husband ended up moving to Arizona. She stayed away for five years before returning to Lone Tree to help out her mother. Not long after her return, DJ got two threatening letters. The author said that he was the killer, and he gave personal details about the Dean family and the murder. In the letter, the writer demanded $100,000. Part of the letter reads, Do you know that I have met your daughter Tammy on a few occasions? Do not make me kill her. Your son is dead. Your husband is dead. Do not risk your daughter. She is the last one left. Investigators thought that since the letter referenced the fact that the Deans lost their son in a train accident two years before Roger was shot, that he may know the Dean family well. Finally, the author said that he would call in six days. True to his word, the writer called DJ on July 27, 1990, and she agreed to pay him $100,000. The call was traced to a phone booth in Denver, but no one was around it when the police went to the phone booth. The person called DJ a dozen times, and twice he gave her a place to drop the money. Both times DJ dropped the money while the FBI and the police watched on, however, no one picked it up. Instead, the writer made one last phone call to Tamara. He said that he would kill her when she least expected it. He said that he was patient and eventually the police would stop watching. Luckily, the caller never acted on his threats. There are currently three theories about the murder and the mysterious calls and letters that came afterwards. The first is that the killer and the extortionist are two completely different people. The extortionist may have known the family well and tried to use the tragedy as an opportunity to get some money. The second theory is that the extortionist knows the killer and the killer told him personal details about the family and the crime. The third is that the killer and the extortionist are the same person. One last thing to note about the letter is that an analysis was performed on it and it suggested that a man and a woman wrote the letter together. The police have DNA from the shooter and it has been inputted into federal databases but unfortunately they have not been able to find a match. The police also have six suspects, but none of them are willing to give up their DNA without a warrant, and the police do not have enough evidence to get a warrant. The police said that the shooter was a white man about six feet tall, and he is between the ages of 20 and 40. Number 4. Baby Parker On July 28, 2005, a woman was walking her dog in a wooded area off of Parkside Drive in Brantford, Ontario, when she made a startling discovery. Wrapped in a towel was the nude body of a newborn baby boy. A short time after the baby was discovered, a man who lived near the park called the police and told them that he found a bloody object in his yard. It was later identified as the placenta. An autopsy was performed and the cause of death hasn't been released, but the baby was born alive and suffered trauma to his ribs and his skull. A week after the body was found, the police received a three-page letter from someone who described themselves as a young girl. She said that she got pregnant after having sex with one of the guys in the neighborhood, but she didn't know who the father of the baby was. She said that she kept the pregnancy secret, and on the night that the baby was born, she was at the park partying with a friend when the contraction started. She went into labor, and her friend helped deliver the baby in the park. 
The mother didn't know the sex of the baby, but her friend said that the baby was dead. The friend then went and placed the body in some bushes, and the friend also got rid of the placenta, but the writer wasn't sure what she did with it. The letter closes with the writer begging the police not to do any DNA testing because she doesn't want anyone, especially the father, to know about the baby. She said that she needed a week to build up the courage and then she would turn herself in. However, she never has. Obviously, the police took DNA samples from the baby, but after testing 100 people, they have not found either parent. The police also have fingerprints from the letter, but like the DNA, it has not turned up a match. Today, the case is cold, but the police are hoping that the conscience of the mother or the friend who helped deliver the baby will force them to come forward and confess. Number 3. The Fort Worth Three Two days before Christmas, in 1974, 17-year-old Mary Rachel Trickla, who went by her middle name, picked up her 14-year-old friend, Lisa Renee Wilson, and Lisa's neighbor's 9-year-old granddaughter, Julie Mosley. First, the girls picked up some presents that were on layaway at an Army-Navy store, and then they went to the Seminary South Shopping Center in Fort Worth, Texas. They were supposed to return home later that afternoon, but they didn't. Their car was found in the upper level of the Sears parking lot. It was locked, and inside were Christmas presents. The police were called, but they assumed that the girls had just run away. The day after the girls were last seen, Rachel's husband, Tommy Trickla, received a letter in the mail. The envelope was addressed to Thomas A. Trickla, and the envelope had the name Rachel on the top left-hand corner. The postmark didn't give a city, instead there was a blurry zip code, which was 76083. What was interesting about the postmark was that the three was backwards, meaning that the hand stamp could have been loaded upside down, which would mean that the last two digits should be switched, making the zip code actually 76038. However, neither of those are zip codes in Texas. Another possibility is that the number should be an 8 and it is just missing its left side. That would make the zip code 76088, which is the zip code for Weatherford, a city about 45 miles away from the mall where the girls were last seen. Inside the envelope was a piece of paper that was too wide for the envelope. The handwriting was childlike and it reads, I know I'm going to catch it, but we just had to get away. We're going to Houston. See you in about a week. The car is in Sears Upper Lot. Love, Rachel. The author of the letter also messed up the spelling on Rachel. Originally the L at the end of the name looked like a lowercase e, and then the person went back over to make it look like an L. Another problem with the letter was that Rachel never called her husband Thomas, she always called him Tommy. So he thought that it was very odd that Rachel would address the letter to Thomas instead of Tommy. Handwriting analyses were performed on the letter, but they have been inconclusive. Tommy and Rachel's mom do not believe that Rachel wrote the letter. The police think that after Christmas shopping, the girls went back to their car and dropped off the presents. When they did, they ran into someone they knew and they went with them. After leaving the mall, they most likely met with foul play. Over the years, there have been several sightings of the girls, but nothing has ever been confirmed. The families of the girls believe they are dead and want to know what happened to them so they can get some closure. Some of the families also believe that Rachel's sister Deborah may know something about the disappearances. Deborah and Tommy had been engaged before he and Rachel got married. She was also living with Rachel and Tommy when the girls disappeared. She was at the home on the day the girls went to the mall, and she was there the morning Tommy got the letter. She has denied any knowledge of what happened to the girls, and she thinks that they were sold into slavery. The police were able to pull DNA from the letter, but there isn't a match on record, and currently the case is cold. Number 2. Nyleen K. Marshall On the afternoon of June 25, 1978, four-year-old Nyleen K. Marshall was at a family outing in Helena National Park near her hometown of Clancy, Montana. Nyleen, who was barefoot, was playing with some other children. Around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the other children were walking ahead of Nyleen, and when they turned around, she was gone. For the next 10 days, search teams looked for the four-year-old. They thought it was possible that she wandered off into the wilderness and got lost. However, since she wasn't wearing shoes, she probably couldn't have gone too far yet they were unable to find any trace of her. Then, in 1983, the police who were working on the disappearance got an anonymous letter. It was typewritten and it was postmarked Madison, Wisconsin, which is about 1,300 miles away from where Nyleen disappeared. In the letter, the writer said that he picked up a girl named Kay, which is Nyleen's middle name. The writer said that he worked from home and had a good income investment. He homeschooled Kay and he also apparently traveled with her around the United States and abroad to Canada and the United Kingdom. He also knew that Nyleen's family missed her, but he loved her too much to give her back. What made the letter so terrifying was that it included details about the case that only the kidnapper would know. 
After the letter, a man claiming to be the author called Child Find Network, which was a hotline for missing kids, and he talked about Nyleen. What the man said has never been made public, but the caller apparently alluded to sexual abuse. One of the calls was traced to a phone booth outside of a pharmacy in Edgerton, Wisconsin, which is about 30 miles away from Addison, where the letter was postmarked. Luckily, this story does have one bright spot. When Nyleen's story aired on the TV show Unsolved Mysteries in November 1990, a boy in Port Roberts, Washington thought that his classmate was Nyleen. The girl wasn't Nyleen, but in an amazing twist of fate, the girl was actually a different kidnap victim. Her name was Monica Bonilla. She had been kidnapped by her non-custodial father in 1982, when she was just five years old. After being missing for eight years, Monica was reunited with her mother, who had spent years and $20,000 searching for her. Unfortunately, no trace of Nyleen has ever been found, and sadly, Nyleen's mother, Nancy, never learned the fate of her daughter. She was murdered in Mexico in July 1995. Number 1. The 3X Killer On July 11, 1930, grocer Joseph Mazinski was in a car in a secluded lover's lane in Queens, New York with 19-year-old Catherine May. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a man walked up to the car, pulled out a gun, and executed Mozinski. The man then forced May out of the car, and she was raped. Afterwards, the killer took her purse and pulled out some letters and then burned them. He then walked May to catch a trolley, and just before she boarded, the man stuffed a note in her hand that read, Joseph Mozinski, 3x3-x-097. It looked like the wording had been stamped on with a rubber stamp and the ink was crimson colored. Two days later, the local newspaper received a letter which said, Kindly print this letter in your paper for Mazinski's friends. CC-NY-ADCM-Y-16A-DQR-PA-241-PM6, Queens. By doing this, you may save their lives. We do not want any more shooting unless we have to. The next day, a second letter came, and it said that Mozinski was a dirty rat. The author also described in detail the murder, including the make of the gun and what ammo he used. He said that Mozinski was killed over some papers that the killer thought he had, but he said that he didn't find the papers he was looking for. He then demanded that the documents that he was looking for be delivered to him, or 14 of Mozinski's friends would die. Two days after the second letter was received, another couple was parking in a lover's lane in Queens. The man approached the car and demanded to see Noel Soley's driver's license. The man then used the flashlight and seemingly flashed a code out into the darkness. The man then said, Yeah, you're the one we want, alright. You're going to get what Joe got. He then pulled out a gun and shot Soley to death. After murdering him, the man rifled through Soli's pockets before turning to Elizabeth Ring, who was in the car with Soli. She held up a religious medallion, which possibly kept her safe because she wasn't harmed, but she was left with a cryptic note. The contents of that note have never been made public. The day after the second murder, the newspaper received two spent shell casings from the murderer, along with a note. The note said that V. Soli was a friend of Mozinski's. The author now said that 13 friends of Mozinski would die, along with a woman, if they did not make peace. Later, on June 21st, Mozinski's brother got a letter, pressuring him to give up the papers. The final letter from the gunman was delivered to the police a short time later. In the letters, he confesses to the crimes in a long, rambling letter. He said that he was a member of the Red Diamond of Russia, which was an anti-communist group. The author said that the last document, NJ4-3-44, had been returned to him on the 19th at 9pm. There was no reason to worry anymore because the killings would stop. And with that, the killer disappeared and no one has ever been arrested for the mysterious string of murders. Thanks for watching this week's video and we hope you enjoyed it. If you want to watch some other videos about unsolved mysteries, please click on one of the videos on the screen now. Also, please subscribe. We post a new video every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And of course, thank you if you already do subscribe. That's all for this week. Thanks again for watching.